All right, we're looking at the textbook, chapter three, specific critiques. Will. Um, I feel like, you know, all throughout this chapter, basically, have like, um, he was going out, and I just noticed he was sitting there and saying, oh, well, this was supposed to be God's people, and then said how, like, just, I know for one. <clears throat> uh, specific, if you don't mind. Yeah. Page I'm number and paragraph. Find the uh, paragraph. He was talking about whenever in the Bible where the Assyrians were around and the angel came around and killed them all. And I don't remember exactly where that is. Yeah, and he was just like, well, it, it might have been that, but I don't think it is. But I can't find that page. I'll find the page. Oh, uh, page 41. The third full paragraph talking about how an angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 Assyrian troops as they slept. According to the Assyrians, the Hebrews bought off the Assyrians with a payment of tribute. That included the Hebrews' king's daughters. It just said, I mean, but even all throughout the rest of it, it, it just I just felt like he was kind of, I don't know if he's like this throughout the whole entire book, but kind of like disregarding a lot of the uh, beliefs of the Hebrews. But well, like we talked about last week, he is, um, he's not sure about supernatural events. You know, he would look at, read the, in the Old Testament, all of the Bible. In fact, the Old Testament in particular, in, in this era, has tons of supernatural events. So he would say, I, I question that, I'm not sure that actually happened that way. You can see that in a number of places in this chapter. So you kind of know that going in that he's going to probably have questions about the supernatural uh, lineage of the Jewish people. So it's a problem because he's not taking the Bible for what it says to be, which we would do. And uh, part of what we're going to do is we look through Pavlak and talk about how we might want to interact with someone who thinks like this. Uh, we're not going to talk to Dr. Pavlak. We're not going to get to know him and that kind of thing in this class. But what we will do is get to people who are influenced by this perspective, this type of thought. Other specific critiques. I've got a handful I'll bring up, but specific ones, Mike. Page 40. Okay. First, first paragraph, mid paragraph. Since it starts more recently, historians have doubted the accuracy and legitimacy of what the ancient Hebrews wrote about their foundations and origins which would be their history. Then you drop down to the next paragraph, the last sentence, um, where he's talking about God also came to be revered as the mo most of the West by most Western civilization. His name in English is convention conventionally spelled with a capital G to distinguish him from other false gods. They claim that God proved his supreme power through the history of the Hebrews. They just got to tell you that the history of the Hebrews was not trustworthy and then he comes down here. So he's just being sarcastic throughout the whole thing. Remember? Well, I don't know about sarcastic as much as inconsistent. And it's like we put on the board, he holds one thing as a historian. Okay, what can I prove? What, what can I look at from history and say this is fact? And at least he has to deal with the Hebrews because factually they're a foundational worldview to Western civilization. We would not exist as we do today without the Hebrew perspective and worldview. It just wouldn't happen. So he has to deal with it, but then he's not going to deal with it at face value biblically. He's not going to look at the Bible and say, okay, I believe that. This is what it says. I believe that. This is what it says. I believe that. He's going to look at it and say, Eh, not really sure because we can't prove it as a historian. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. The reality is people have doubted the accuracy and legitimacy of much which the ancient Hebrews wrote about their foundations and origins well before modern history. That's not a new development. Okay? Now, when he says that, he says that, that and, and he wants his readers to then doubt the legitimacy of what the Hebrews have said. The problem with that is for us as Christians, number one, we take the Bible to be truth, but number two, archaeology and history doesn't actually back up its position. Uh, we can find from archaeology evidence that leads us to believe that the Hebrews were, you know, were accurate at least.
studies for the most part in writing their own history. Of course, we believe that comes from God, so we know it's going to be accurate, but then archaeology actually backs that up and gives us kind of a foundation to hold to. We're going to look at a couple examples in our lecture notes today. Um, other specific critiques, Nicholas? Uh, on page 41, the first um, main uh, paragraph uh, says Egyptian sources don't mention uh, the Hebrew captivity by the Egyptians. Uh huh. Um, I I think it's weird. I, I mean, I don't really understand how they why would they don't have that. Why they didn't mention the Hebrew captivity if it was such a big event in the Book of Exodus. Big event for who? The, <laughs> the Hebrew. <laughs> Yeah. Same thing with the Assyrians. Do you think the Assyrian record keepers are going to write that they lost 185,000 men in one in one night's battle? And not only that they lost 185,000 men, but they lost it to a miracle. Do you think that their history recorders are going to come back? It's not like today where we believe in recording everything. Good, bad, ill, indifferent. At, at, that's not ancient history. Ancient history was written by the people in power, and they also were required to write their leaders in a good light. Why do you think it would be important to write the Assyrian king in a good light? Because the Assyrian king could take your head off. So history recorders didn't record their downfalls and their failures and their flaws. <coughs> they just didn't. They recorded the benefits and the good things and so it's actually not surprising at all that you wouldn't find a record in Egypt because they have their tails kicked by God's plagues coming out of the Exodus. Pharaoh got beat. Pharaoh was God in the Egyptian, in the Egyptian religious structure. He got beat by the Hebrew God. They're not going to record that. They're not going to tell us their failures and their flaws. So that's not surprising. That doesn't automatically mean it happened. I, I, I don't want us to create, I don't want us to say more than we can. But what I do want us to do is to realize that that shouldn't surprise us that it's not there. I mean, I believe it happened, but I don't think then we can extrapolate because the Egyptians didn't mention it automatically happened. No, I just think that's what we should expect to find. We couple ancient historians and the way they wrote with the biblical evidence. Well, yeah, they're not going to write about their getting their butts in. It's just not going to be a part of, you know, Egypt's history. Same thing with Assyria, same thing with others. Devin. All right, the, uh, page 40. Okay. The uh, second natural paragraph, um, the second sentence. The Hebrews believe that God created two human beings and man and woman, although there are two versions of the story often two contradictory accounts of their formation. I thought the Hebrews took very seriously the Old Testament and everything is it saying that the humans have a second view of how creation started? He's talking about Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, many, he, some conservative scholars even told me this, that Genesis 1 and 2 offer differing positions or differing viewpoints on the cre on creation. And if you read them, they're, they are different. It doesn't mean they're different events. It means they're written from a different perspective. Uh, of course, we believe that Genesis was written by Moses, who was not a witness to the events. He wasn't there when Adam and Eve were created. He wasn't there when the flood happened. We believe that God spoke, you know, those events, revealed those events to Moses, who then recorded it for our benefit in the book of Genesis. I have no problem with that. You have no problem with that as uh, Bible students. I don't, I don't look at that and question that because God gave it to Moses thousands of years after the events took place. However, if you go in your quiet time tonight or in a few three minutes and read Genesis 1, you've got the list of creation. You know, you got day one, God created light and, and uh, darkness. And then day two, God created the waters above and the waters below. And then day three, God created the land and the plants. And then day four, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, fish and birds. And day six, animals and man. And it, it explains that a little bit. And then day two, or excuse me, chapter two, explains it from a different perspective. Now, I don't think that's too troubling, personally, for a lot of reasons. Many times what you get in Scripture is one chapter or one segment in the Bible 
explaining something one way, and then another chapter coming right on top of that, and it, it kind of pulls back and looks at it at a broader view, or it dives in and looks at it more specifically. You see this in the book of Revelation all the time. Revelation is a circular book, and it, it, often you'll see like chapter, uh, you've got God's judgments in chapters uh, 14, 15, 16, or something like that. And then you've got God's specific judgment on Babylon, the, uh, the dragon, Babylon. Well, in a part, what the writer does, John the Revelator, when he puts that down, he's explaining the judgment broadly, and then he jumps in and dives into that judgment specifically and spends two or three chapters just dealing with that particular judgment that he's already written about in a very specific fashion. So it's not that he's talking about two different things. So he's talking about one thing broadly, and then he's talking about another thing specifically. That's common writing. And we do that. You know, you'll write a summary paragraph, and then you'll dive in and explain one of your points specifically. Or at least that's what you should do in good writing. You turn in like a research paper. But that's what Genesis 1 and 2 is. Genesis 1 is a it's kind of a broad overview explanation, and then Moses kind of pinpoints this on the creation of Adam and Eve. I don't think it means that there are two different accounts. But modern historians look at that and say that's not the way we would have done it. We're looking at this from a... An, that's, but you can't judge ancient history through a modern lens. You can't do it. Because they didn't. Moses would have had that when he wrote it. He's not writing to fulfill our historical scientific obligations. Right? I mean, he's writing from 3,500 years ago within his own framework of history and observation. And the way he wrote fits that time, doesn't fit our time. And that's the challenge of interpretation or you know, We have to learn how to go back into the biblical world, understand what was said and why it was said, so then we can explain it and how it fits in our modern context. Sorry, that's a lot more than you wanted. But Kevin? Um, if I could backtrack for just a second, um, Nick mentioned uh, page 41 um, where it says the, uh, in the, fir the first full paragraph, the Egyptian sources do not mention the Hebrew captivity. And he seems to be kind of using that to say, you know, it, it may not be accurate because, yeah. but um, from last week's reading on page 32, the very, very, uh, the sentence starts at the very bottom right corner of 32 um, it says later Pharaoh's erased Akhenaten's very name from the dynastic uh, dynastic records um, wouldn't that be kind of a pretty good evidence that they get they get rid of history they don't like yeah but at been... least we have it with Akhenaten right but of course Akhenaten was a Pharaoh he was buried uh -huh. and so we have it because we found this too. Right. Okay, so yeah, but that you're exactly right. It is good evidence that they would control what what stories went into their history. Sure. And you don't have, I mean, ancient histories do not record the failings of their, of their leaders <clears throat> and their nation. They just don't do it. You do not see that. The Bible, in some ways, is unique in that department. Right. Because all throughout the Old Testament, you have a record not just of God's glorious victories. You have plenty of record of humanity. Think Israel, their flaws and their failures and their disobedience and their destruction, the battles they lost. It's embarrassing. It's actually embarrassing history to read the Old Testament. Not for God, but for the people, for humankind. It's embarrassing history. That's unique. And that actually requires us as... Uh, as Bible students, but also as preachers and teachers, and then also people that are just reading Scripture to interact with that idea. Why would we have these matter-of-fact stories of the defeat and the doom and the sin and the unrighteousness and the unbared depravity that we see the people of Israel and Israel's leaders in the Old Testament? Why? Do you think David, if he controlled everything that went in the the historical records, do you think he would have written about the events of Bathsheba? No, and he certainly wouldn't have written about the events that happened with his children after that. You know, Absalom and Tamnar, and, or uh, Amnon and Tamnar, and then Absalom's uh, rebellion, 
I mean, he was broken after Absalom died. He's not going to record that for everybody to know and see. Why is it recorded? Because God's the author of the Bible, not me. Amen. When you read the Old Testament, you don't read something, when you read the Bible as a whole, you don't read something that we're going to, you know, a, a guy's going to think this up, hey, this would be a great story to include. No, it's included because God wanted it included. And the prophets and the writers and the recorders of Scripture had a sense of this is coming from God or this is what God wants recorded, not just what I want or what our king wants or what our leadership wants. It's not, not a record of victories. The only, victor the only one victor victorious throughout the Bible is God. The, pe the people in the Bible, they, I mean, they just struggle over and over and over again. It's just like us. We can't take credit for any victories we experience in our lives. It's all of God. Right. Right. Um, on page one, or, one or two more and then we're going to move on to the lecture. Right. Yes, sir, where are you at? Uh, on page 45, um, okay. it's the last full paragraph. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people today say that people back then, it was, it was it's not the same as sin today that was, well, I'm trying to think how to say this, but we people feel like we get tempted today more than people would back in the Bible days, or back in the day. Uh, but it says, even with God and the prophets to follow, it was difficult for the Hebrews to maintain their distinctive faith with so many nature-worshipping polytheists around and among them. Um, and they feared that uh, they would seduce them into idolatry and demon worship. Uh, it also says, uh, the fertility rituals and sex imitation of the gods were tempting. They were tempted just like we were today. And even uh, Jezebel talked her husband into promoting the Canaanite fertility god, Baal. And it, it just shows here that um, people back then were tempted just as we, were, we are today, just as much. That's, that's how I felt about it. There's no excuse. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, Pavlak is not afraid to call fact when he deals with the failures and the flaws of <laughs> their sins and weaknesses and temptations. He doesn't question that part of the story. He just questions the supernatural part of the story, which points well made, Douglas. Uh, sin's always been sin, temptation's always been temptation. We don't live in a more depraved world. I think we live in a world with more access to sin, but not more sin, and not more depraved sin. Okay? The depravity we see today has been around since me and The difference, I think, today is the access to it is far easier than, say, in some areas and some time frames. Marquise. I think back then, the sin, it stuck out a lot more than now. Um, now, sin is it's like it's covered up. Like it's, it's, back then, it was like when he was talking about the, uh, the Jezebel thing. Like, now you see somebody, for instance, um, a Jezebel, you know, and she, it, it looks... Pretty, it looks covered up, but on the inside, it's, it's you know, you get what I'm saying. Behind the, let me see. When he was talking about sin, I, I, I had it in my mind when he was talking about sin was how it now today is the same way tempted, but it's it's in a different format. Yeah, it's it's, it's just different. I mean, it's, it's in sin, sin, but it fit the culture. Yeah, it's just different sin. It's the same sin, but it's coming in different forms and fashions and all that different now. So we got to be able to identify. Yep. You know. Oh, it's in it's it fits within its cultural trappings. Right, right. Yeah, sin, sin is presented in the media every day as, as the as the right way cool or thing. the end way or you know the popular way. See, that's what a lot of teens fall into temptation and stuff like that because they're thinking that, that, that sin is you know cool to do. You know what I mean? Right. They make they paint the picture and they cover it up because it makes yeah. you know it make the rappers yeah. make sin sound like it's you know the cool thing to do you know and yep. they, they don't think about it they don't have the knowledge to go out and, and I mean you got rappers like the creative you know rap on it but then you got other rappers that's promoting it to other kids and they're not you know they ain't thinking twice about that they just think yeah. man that sounds cool you know I'm gonna go I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that so. I think I think that it's the same exact thing as it was back then because you read page forty five full paragraph it says the Hebrews were likewise unusual they're secular and they're the sacred nature of their king, or I don't know if it's that 
but basically in here it talked about how they didn't have a king that had uh, judges, but whenever they brought in kings, you know, the destruction started to come. So, I mean, it's similar to that, but they just looked at all the other secular nations and were just like, oh, well, you know, it's cool to have a king. Let's, let's all have a king. Yep. So, same thing as... They wanted to be like everybody else. Yeah. Let me uh, bring up two more specific critiques, and then we'll be done with the textbook uh, for the day. The first one, the page, uh, page 40, it's the paragraph down at the bottom before the last one. It starts, many cultures have similar myths of origin. It's the last sentence in that paragraph. He writes, although stories of origin cannot be literally true, they resonate with the miraculous mythic power in our culture. Of course, he's, you know, tipping his hand there. He believes they can't literally be true because we came, came about by evolutionary means. Which is problematic. He's, compar he's comparing God and the Israelites to Daniel Boone and Paul Bunyan. Well, what he's doing, well, Daniel Boone was a real character. Paul Bunyan wasn't. Uh, but like the ancient, the ancient historical, the ancient uh, <coughs> creation stories of Babylon and other stories, what he's saying is he's lumping Israel's story, Genesis 1 and 2, with the Babylonian story and the Assyrian story and the, and the Sumerian story and the other origin Ooh. stories. He's lumping them all together and saying they can't literally be true. Well, to, to a degree, he's right. They all can't literally be true at the same time. Sure. Because they're differing view, uh, uh, truth claims. It's like Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, and Hinduism cannot all be said true at the same time. Uh, it, that's a different topic. It can be. One can be true, and if Islam's true, Christianity's not. If Christianity's true, Islam's not. You know, if the account from Babylonia about creation is true, then the biblical account's not true. But so, my nose little off topic. What does, what does the, the, the people that believe in other religions look at us as? Do they just like, man, those groups a lot. Do, we look, do they look at us as lost? I mean, well, some of them do. I was wondering. But in modern culture, the, the outline we put on the board last week, right. what contemporary culture does is lump every religious system in that bottom line where it says little t truth. And they would make the case that Islam is true for those who worship Islam, right. and Christianity is true for those who worship Christianity, and Hinduism is true for those who worship all of the millions of God within the Hindu pantheons, or some of them. Buddhism is true for those who hold to Buddhism, and they would say there's no big T truth when it comes to religious truth claims. And there's not. They're, what's true for you might not be true for somebody else. Right. We would disagree with that, and many in other religious systems would disagree with that because Muslims don't think that they're one truth among many truths. They think they're the only ones that are right. So yes, many Muslims do look at Christians and say, you're wrong and you're going to spend an eternity separate from Allah. And I'm right. Many Hindus feel that way. Many Buddhists feel that way. Uh, many Christians obviously feel that way. And so culture tries to put it all together where you don't have to have the, the argument and the discussion at all for contemporary uh, historians, contemporary religious scholars, etc., etc. Devin? It's kind of like those ridiculous bumper stickers that say coexist. Yeah, I wrote a, I wrote a blog post on that. I, I hate seeing those. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I appreciate this sentiment. The sentiment is that we should all be able to get along. Get along yeah, but, uh, the problem is that it, it appears like they're trying to say we're, we should get along by accepting the truth of all of these at the same time, and you can't do it. I would be honored to sit in a room with a Muslim, a Hindu, and a Buddhist and have an honest discussion about religious truth and what they believe. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not mean-spirited or mad at them. I, I feel sorry for them. You know, they're, they're going to die and spend eternity separated from God in, in hell, having hold, holding as sincere a belief in something that's false as I hold in something that's true. So yeah, I, I'm heartbroken. You don't, you don't have to be mad about it. A lot of Christians are mad. And they're right, but they're mad about being right. And that's that's a problem. We don't need to be that way. Right. So the sentiment of coexist, I have a, I don't have a problem with it. 
but it's not the sentiment that they're trying to encourage. It's the again that doesn't work if it's big T truth. Because Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, <coughs> Buddhism, uh, they all can't get along if all of them are equally big T true. It just doesn't fit. Those worldviews cannot go and coexist as all being right at the same time. It does. They try to make it work by dropping it a step down and saying it's true for you, Dad, it's not true for me. Uh, let me uh, let's move on to page 45. The first full paragraph uh, starts with the Hebrews. If you'll go down to the very last sentence of that first full paragraph, where it reads, God made a covenant with the people of Israel, not the kings of Israel. Well, that's biblically problematic for one thing. God made a covenant with David. He did make a covenant with kings generally, but he did make a covenant with king, a king specifically. Uh, you can find that story. So that's, that, he just didn't do his homework there. But then... He writes in the very next sentence, and this is poor argumentation, poor writing, poor history. Okay? Thus originated the Western principle of the separation of church and state. And I've got there a big question mark on what in the world is he talking about? Because I do think that the principle of freedom of religion comes from a biblical framework. I think that the founders of our nation did that. The concept of separation of church and state is not a concept inherent in the Bill of Rights as a discussion of religious freedom. It's not even in the Constitution. The idea of separation of church and state came from Thomas Jefferson, and it was actually a Baptist who wrote Thomas Jefferson uh, questioning, because there was a there was a uh, an attempt, kind of like the, the state um, legislature in Virginia, I believe it was, was acknowledging a particular denomination. And this this uh, Baptist pastor wrote Thomas Jefferson about it. And Jefferson said that no, there is a separation between church and state, indicating that the state was not going to sanction a particular denomination. And in Jefferson's mind, and in his understanding, it wasn't about the church not interacting with the state. It was about the state not dictating what church there will be, and the state not dictating how the church should function, which is why you have freedom of religion in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law uh, abridging the, uh, one's freedom of religion, one's ability to decide what they believe fits within their religious views. In other words, the state stays out of religion, not the other way around. And historically, that just makes sense because what our founders had experienced uh, through testimony, through family members, is the religious wars of the 1500s and 1600s where Protestants fought Catholics and Catholics fought Protestants. And if you were a if you were in France, you were a Catholic, it didn't matter what you believed. Because if you were a Protestant, you were persecuted. Uh, and if you were in England, you weren't a Catholic, because if you were a Catholic, you were persecuted because you had to be a part of the Church of England. That's the context in, in which our nation was founded. And our founding fathers didn't want the state to dictate a particular denomination. So it's the idea of state staying out of the church from the other way around. More on that later. I just thought that was a really poor connection. I don't know where he I don't even know how he finds separation of church and state in that, because the biblical the politics in the Old Testament was a theocracy. They weren't even supposed to be a king. Supposed to be the people following God, right? Underneath the structure of prophets and priests. The kings were their own, you know, their own desire and their own out of their own desire and own well, I, and sniffles. You might have said it, um, but was there an example of separation of church and state in Bible time? You might have said that. But. I think that the founding fathers connect freedom of religion to a uh, to the biblical concept of how we're created and we're created to think and we're created on our own. Uh, there's a... Uh, I can't remember the name of the book now that I read that shows that, that actually discusses the, the scriptural passages that some of the founders used as, ba as a baseline for their discussion of the Bill of Rights and, and freedom of religion and freedom uh, to make their, own, make their own decisions. But there's not a specific biblical example. Because the government structure, one thing our founding fathers didn't do was look at the Bible for their government structure. 
they didn't they they gave credit to God for the revolution and us winning the war for independence, but they didn't then turn around and say, We're going to create a government structure like ancient Israel. They didn't do that. Because they believed that was a flawed uh, that would have been a flawed perspective. They weren't Israel. They weren't God's chosen people he had set apart um, uniquely as, I mean, yeah, God provided for our freedom, but not in the same way. And certainly we don't answer to God in the same way ancient Israel did. We're, we don't, we're not fall under their same prescriptions governmentally or politically. And so they didn't, they didn't look to the Bible for an example of, you know, political structure. They looked to a lot of other things. The Bible informed it, in, right. in a sense. It was the foundation, but not so much the structure. Exactly. Of it. Yes. Then, Real quick, um, more on that topic. Uh, has everyone in here seen the monumental Kirk Cameron? What's in that? You seen that? But he, he, he goes um, up north, um, New England, and, and finds out all about the, the founding fathers that came here. How they were like struggling in England to like be able to worship God the way they wanted to, and, and, and I mean, it, it, it's just—it's insane the, the amount of struggle they went through in order to be able to come here to actually have Christianity here. I mean, it, it, if you guys haven't seen it, you, you should. Monumental—it's it's, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, it's just—it's ridiculous. It blows your mind. Like, you have no idea, you know. Actually, watch this. You know what actually took place. It's incredible. Yeah, Christians in England were persecuted. I mean, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress from prison because he why? Because he was a Christian. No, because he was a Christian outside the Church of England. He didn't fit their idea of what a church should look like, and people came to the New World to have freedom of religion. Interestingly enough. You know what they did when they came to the New World? They created their new, a new state, a religious state. In New England, they dictated to everybody else who would work, who, how they would experience their worship. Many of the Puritans went that direction uh, before, of course, the War for Independence and the Constitution was set. It's why you have uh, Roger Williams, the first Baptist, he actually started preaching in New England. He was kicked out because he wasn't preaching in a way that fit the churches, the Puritan churches up there, and so he was kicked out and went to Rhode Island and started the First Baptist Church. So freedom of religion wasn't even an absolute at the beginning of the New World in the colonies. It, it didn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't certified and planned for until you had the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Okay, uh, let's take a break.